in case you didn't know this, June is Pride Month. But, just checking, the LGBT lobby has commandeered many more dates on the calendar for their wayward purposes. As my next guest recently highlighted, there are at least 24 international LGBTQIA plus awareness days in addition to Pride Month. Now, some of these days are Drag Day, Pronoun Day, uh, Trans Awareness Week and Month, and Transparency Day. I mean, there's just no end to it. No other subject known to humanity has been afforded such a salute on our yearly calendar as the LGBTQIA plus XYZ. Um, you know what this tells me is that, you know, if you look at someone's calendar, it tells you their priorities or their preoccupation. And you look at where what we're doing as a nation, I would say that at least for the political class, this is our preoccupation and where we placed our priorities, which is why we have so many problems, in my view. Well, here to discuss this is Dr. Jennifer Bowen. She is FRC's director of the Center for Family Studies. She's a former professor of research methods and a doctor of clinical social work. Jennifer, welcome to the program. Hi, Tony. Thanks for having me. Well, let's talk about, I, I want to play a clip here first before we get started, because uh, last week was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was Trans Week. Or was it Trans Day within the Trans Week, or I can't keep up with it? It was the week before, but it just kept rolling okay. on. Well, it was, yeah, because last week they were continuing to talk about it. And uh, Jen Psaki, uh, of course, what's happening in Florida with the Parental Rights and Education Bill has uh, given uh, some rise to this. But uh, I want to play this clip of uh, Jen Psaki, White House Press Secretary, uh, talking about... Uh, the life-saving care for transgender youth. Play clip eight, please. Every major medical association agrees that gender-affirming health care for transgender kids is a best practice and potentially life-saving. All right. Every major medical association agrees. Now, I actually, I probably, I probably wouldn't refute that statement. So I'm going to ask you this question, Dr. Bow Bowens, is... Does the science support this gender-affirming health care for transgender kids that's being put forward in terms of surgeries and hormone-blocking hormone drugs? Well, at the risk of sounding snarky, um, I think what's happening right now is you have big medical groups, big mental health groups, um, big pharma. You have all these big thing, entities that are basically um, doing Jedi tricks. They think they identify as Jedi warriors and they can just wave their hand and say, the science is good. And the science is not good. Um, all you have to do is unpack it just a little bit and we can begin to see how poor the science is to support such a invasive physiological issue. So it, do, they, do they not think that people on the other side of this debate they, do they think they don't look at the science or that they can't read? I think so. Um, when you that's look the at arrogance, they can just throw this out there. The science says, yeah. and they they think no one will question them. Well, certainly, the media doesn't question them. Right, and you have um, big medical groups like American Pediatrics that were eighty percent of their membership is saying we want something other than hormone treatments for our patients. But the top echelon of the, those medical groups is saying, no, this is affirming care, this is saving lives, and it's built on a lie. But has that become political within those associations where these advocacy groups have commandeered these associations? Yeah, it, it really has become political. And the other issue to think about is this whole ideology is built on social constructivism, which basically says there is no truth that truth is elusive, and you can believe what you want to believe, you can identify how you want to identify. And so when you hold that position, of course you're not going to be wedded to being truthful with the science as well. But, but isn't that a slippery slope? I mean, from a, I mean, you're a social worker. I mean, you, you studied the impact of sociology and, and thinking collectively as a society. If we jettison truth in this area, which is fixed, by, by, by biology, mm -hmm. science, if we, if we jettison that, what's next? Yeah, 
exactly, we're in trouble. And this is where, you know, we get back to the Bible, it says truth has fallen in the streets, you know, and we need to pick up truth again. And um, for those who are caught up in this ideology, you have to think, where does it end? Today you could identify as the opposite sex, but what about tomorrow? If we think that gender fluidity is real, then why why would right. that shift from one moment to the so, next? Uh, um, well, let me... Let me um let me play another clip. This is from last week, uh, testimony before the House Committee on Education and Labor, uh, Secretary, I think this was Secretary Becerra, uh, and this was uh, Congresswoman Mary Miller asked uh, this question. Clip number nine, please. Is it child abuse to perform a sex change operation on a 12-year-old girl? Congress yes or no? I'm not going down that rat hole with you. Well, unfortunately, I think the Biden administration has taken us all down that rat hole with their policies. But these procedures, a surgery, a sex change operation, you can't reverse that. No, you can't reverse it. And there's no evidence that um, cross-sex hormones or puberty blockers, that, that they, they're reversible. You certainly can't reverse a surgery. I mean, that's pretty obvious. But these other interventions that they keep claiming are reversible, they're not. And we don't know what are the ramifications, uh, the psychological ramifications of delaying puberty for a child. Um, Do we know the physical ramifications either? Yeah. Because, I mean, this is relatively new where we're, we're doing this. I mean, the long-term complications of using drugs that were not intended for these purposes that are being used for this. Yeah, we don't have long-term data. Um, either in the, the physical realm or the psychological realm, but especially in the psychological realm, uh, we don't know how someone's gonna be affected by taking these things over the long term because you know, NIH isn't um, putting out grant requests for, for that kind of information to be sought after. Well, that's actually another topic that I, I, I want to get to is when we look at the science, we're not, I mean, when I, I've been here at the Family Research Council almost 20 years, and there was a time when we, we actually had debates over these topics, mm -hmm. and we presented the facts. I remember when I was in office, though, when we would adopt policy or propose policy, we would use the social science to either oppose or to support a particular policy, you name whatever it is. But we're seeing many on the left who are trying to stop academic research yeah. that, quite frankly, they can't defend their policy, so they want to shut down any type of uh, scientific, social, uh, empirical data that's being gathered and presented. Yes, and we see that all the time by the lack of grant requests for issues like, what are, what are the experiences of detransitioners? Um, we don't know. There are very few studies. And what we do see in that case is that um, I, I want to say like 57 percent said that uh, of those who detransitioned said they had an inadequate mental health evaluation. Forty percent said they felt pressure from their mental health provider. So we don't you can see why um, this kind of data is being squelched, because that's that's the truth. That's um, that's the reality that goes against the transgender ideology, and, um, and it needs to be seen so that people can make informed decisions about their care. Well, just taking a couple of aspects of that, most children moving through what, I, it's kind of like to me, it's kind of like the, uh, uh, you know, the re-entry, when you're coming in out of space, there's this blackout, you kind of lose connection with the rest of society and you're mm -hmm. questioning all of these things, but upwards of 80% uh, come out of that and they revert to normal. Uh, mm -hmm. They go back to how they were created to be, the, the questions are answered, they work through those issues. Uh, is that not correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So if we would just leave these kids alone, they would find out who they are, which is what we all go through when we're developing, we're trying to figure out who we are. And so then you throw this ideology into the mix. It's really, it's unfair. And a, and a big portion of these kids have experienced abuse, right. not all of them, but um, so you just throw in a lot of different thoughts that are unnecessary for, for a very vulnerable age. Um, 
Well, so you combine that with what we're seeing in public policy. Okay, you've got these kids that are questioning. So we have states that are passing um, prohibitions against getting counseling. So that if they're having these questions, they can't even, their parents, in some cases, like California, can't even take them to a counselor to, to discuss this. And we're talking about mm -hmm. talk therapy, if you will. Just mm -hmm. talking through this and, and thinking through this before they make a decision. So you have some prohibiting them from having conversations about whether or not this is good for them. Then mm -hmm. on the other side, you have those pushing this idea that, oh, you need to, you need to start these hormone blockers or you need to consider this sex change operation. I mean, this is, I'm just going to say this is demonic in its approach to mm -hmm. what it's doing to our children. Yeah, when you shut down any kind of discussion or discovery of what what the root issues are, one, you're delaying treatment. So not only are you doing harm by initiating a child into these practices, but you're doing harm because you're delaying the real source of what's going on with this child. And, and then you're unnecessarily interfering and in introducing their bodies as well as their psyches to a whole horrible <laughs> outcome. Um, and we don't know what's the, what the fruit of this is going to be over the long term with a whole generation of kids introduced to this. Now, one of the justifications that the, the left uses for this is that um, you know, we see high rates of suicide among these um, young people and that this is the solution to that. But again, the social science and the statistics don't back that up. No, they don't back it up at all. And, um, and I would say that's not just true of suicide, it's true of mental health. So we, we can't forget that the whole um, gender-affirming therapy is supposed to address the issue of gender dysphoria, which is a diagnosis in the DSM, um, the Diagnostic, Diagnostic Manual for um, Mental Disorders. And there is no way that you can even determine whether or not the effect of these hormones, surgeries, which incidentally should all be assessed individually, and they're kind of treated as this package. Um, so we don't know, it's not nuanced enough in the research, but for one, the, the research methods alone do not allow us to make some kind of causal link that these surgeries are having, or hormones, are having an impact on gender dysphoria, or men, which would be a mental health issue, right. or suicide for that matter. So, Dr. Bowens, let's, let's talk practically for just a moment here, because we're seeing this, it's, it's really kind of a social contagion mm -hmm. that we're seeing through social media and in our schools, that this is kind of the thing that's being pushed on kids and they're going down, in some cases, these irreversible courses. What can parents be doing to, number one, looking for the signs, yeah. number two, how do they address it and approach it with their, their son or their daughter? Well, I think one thing is, to stay open in your communication with your child. Um, ask them what they're learning in school. Ask them what they're hearing from their peers. Um, I think sometimes parents are so busy and with work and then social media and um, checking Facebook. I, I've heard that so many times, and I think it's so important that we're aware of what's going on with our children. Um, but also to be in communication with these schools. We know um, some of our other uh, co-workers here at FRC are doing great work on the education front, and we know some of the things that are getting, fortunately getting yeah. exposed right now. Yeah. So remain aware and be active um, with your child's schooling. And, and here's one thing. from a, uh, a lot of Christian parents feel guilt. I mean, if, if a child chooses to go down this path and, and they say, well, I've got to love my child. Well, certainly you love them, but there's this conflating of love and affirmation. You, you, we can't affirm every choice. We have to point our children in the right direction, but we love them regardless yes. of what they might do. But that doesn't mean we have to affirm every choice they make. That's right. That's right. And a lot of times we want to um, just do what the doctors tell us or what the schools tell us, but this is not, I can tell you, this is not going to be a path that's helpful for your child. In the end, their brains aren't even developed enough to make these kinds of decisions. They can't even vote yeah. <laughs> at the ages that some of these kids are being introduced to this ideology. 
Um, so, you know, I think keeping that in mind that they don't really know what they want. And remember what you were like when you were a child. Yeah, you and unfortunately, you know, parents have been made uh, in this culture to seem as if they're not relevant. Mm -hmm. But actually, the, the studies, we don't have time to go into it, show that, that children really do want to hear from their parents. They want mm -hmm. that guidance from their parents. Nothing can be more influential in the life of a child than an engaged, loving parent. Yeah, that's right. Dr. Jennifer Bowens, thanks so much for uh, for being with us. Thanks Great for to having talk me. with you. And folks, I encourage